we would have been listening to the Ten Thousand Fists version of Land of Confusion. Although the original Genesis version, also highly recommended. All right, and the reason for this actually was because what we're studying now is the beginning of um, quantum or wave mechanics, and that kind of led people to completely rethink physics, and people were a little confused for a while, so hence the song. All right. And now for something completely different. And it is. So we're studying the electronic structure of atoms now, and like I said, um, this required a completely new branch of physics to explain the structure of electrons or kind of what they were doing when they were in atoms. Now, um, there is a brief segue because most of what we know about electrons and atoms, um, we got by studying the interaction of light with those electrons. And people, I mean, have been aware of light for a while, but it wasn't until the 17th century that people did some really uh, in-depth studies about it. And one of the first things that people found was that if you took light that didn't seem to have color, uh, white light, um, that actually it was colored. And if you put it through a piece of glass with the right shape, um, that you could make a rainbow. And people knew that there was different colored lights, but this colorless light um, was actually made up of all colors. And one thing that Newton did and other people didn't think to do was that if you take this rainbow that you made and put it through uh, the same type of glass, but sort of oriented the other way, that you could actually recombine them and get the white light back. Now, um, people spent a lot of time trying to figure out if light is a wave or if it was a particle or what. And for the very longest time, um, Newton actually thought it was a particle, more on that in a bit. Um, but it turns out that for a long time, the evidence seemed to imply that it was a wave. So I need to tell you a little bit about waves and how we describe them. All right, so this figure here points out a couple of the um, main points of waves. So that we use to describe them. Number one is a thing called a frequency, which is the number of complete cycles that, you, that occur in one second. So it has units of cycles per second, so inverse seconds, which is also called a hertz. And so a wave, phenom wave phenomena looks something like this, um, where the value of the thing, whether it is the height of a column of water, whether it is air pressure from sound, or light intensity kind of goes up goes down, goes back up, and uh, the and this would be one complete cycle. So you go from a starting point in the wave and go back to that same point in the next wave. So it can be from top to top. It could be bottom to bottom. It could be from middle to middle, but usually you know, top to top or bottom to bottom are the easiest ways to mark it. And in this case, in this particular wave, you've got four complete cycles that would occur in our um, are one second here. And in this particular wave, this has a twice the frequency. You've got eight complete cycles in that same period of time. And here we've got 16 cycles. So this is a by factor of four. The other thing that we often use to describe a wave is the wavelength. And that is the amount of physical space in between the same part of two successive waves. Again, so going from peak to peak, this distance here would be the wavelength of our four hertz wave. This is the wavelength of our eight hertz wave, and this is the wavelength of our 16 hertz wave. And you can see that there is an inverse relationship between them. The smaller the frequency, the larger the wavelength. So this has fewer cycles in the same period of time, which corresponds to a longer duration and space for the wave. So they're inversely related, and this is important to know. The other thing I want to point out um, is this thing called a node. And 
this graphic did not end up where it was supposed to be. So let me fix it here. Get my pen here. A node is where the wave crosses the zero or center point. So for example, that's a node. And I think this one was meant to be pointing, let's say somewhere right here. So there's a node there and let me get the pointer back here. So anytime this wave crosses this center, mathematically it's often zero line, that's a node. So that's a node, that's a node, that's a node. Here on this screen or this curve, it'll be here, 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 so on and so forth. And those are important things to note as well. The other thing is intensity, and that is just how high up and down the wave goes. Um, within the context of chemistry, that's the one parameter we don't discuss a whole heck of a lot. Wavelength and frequency are the big ones, though, so let's expand on that. So we talked about so we talked about them being inversely related, and here's the exact relationship. Now this um, applies for any wave phenomena, whether it is sound, light, anything. And that the product of the wavelength and the frequency equals the velocity of that wave. In equation speak for light, you usually see it like this. Um, so this is a lowercase Greek lambda, which is usually what we use to denote wavelength. This is a lowercase Greek letter nu, which we use to denote frequency. And this nu looks a lot like an italicized V, um, depending on your font set, so be aware of that. And then their product is equal to the speed. And since the speed of light is an important enough thing in, in science, it gets its own letter. We normally denote that with C. So just to give you some an idea, so these are related. So if you know any two of these, you know three. The speed of light is a constant. So if you are given the frequency, you should be able to figure out the wavelength and vice versa. So actually, let's do the, the vice versa. So if you have a Blu-ray player at home um, that uses a very small and, and safely very weak laser um, that emits a frequency of 405 nanometers. And so you could be asked, for example, what that frequency is. So the first thing you need to do is figure out what this nanometer is. And I did this because in, within this context, nanometers are a wavelength that are very often used to describe visible light because it's a convenient one. And a nanometer is one billionth or one times 10 to the negative ninth meter. So this 405 nanometers, we've got our conversion factor here corresponds to 4.5 times 10 to the seventh. And I apologize again, that should be just straight up meters. All right, and now we can rearrange this equation up here to solve for the frequency. So it's gonna say new equals. And if you do the algebra, you've got the frequency equals the speed divided by the wavelength. The speed of light to three sig figs, you can, um, Average it at, at 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters per second and divided by our 4.05 times 10 to the negative seven meters. And that gives us a frequency of 7.41 times 10 to the 14th inverse seconds or hertz, either one are appropriate. All right, so that's how we relate, um, so the frequency and wavelength relation is kind of an important one. So the last thing I wanna do for this video is kind of show you the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Now, light, it turns out, is a very, very general term. And it's all the same thing. It is all a oscillating electric field. Um, what separates radio waves from microwaves to X-rays merely is the frequency and correspondingly the wavelength. And what this graphic shows you now, first of all, this is a logarithmic scale. So each of these, we're talking about frequencies going up by a factor of 10 each two tick marks. And what I wanted to show you was actually what a small chunk of that visible light actually is. All right, so your TV and old school broadcast radio 
our old school broadcast TV as well, um, use wavelengths that are on the order of meters. So we're down here in this range and correspondingly frequencies on the order of 10 to the fourth to 10 to the eighth seconds. Um, <clears throat> microwaves, um, like your microwave oven, uses electromagnetic radiation that is in the centimeter range, so about 10 to the minus 2 range. Infrared light, so the stuff that you interpret, your eyes aren't sensitive to it, but parts of your skin are, so it feels warm, are somewhere in the millimeter to micrometer range. And ultraviolet and visible light are in the nanometer range, about 10 to the minus 9 meters. So it is useful, convenient, I should say, to explore visible light, um, explain visible light in terms of nanometers for their wavelength. So remember, it's inverse. So red light has the lowest frequency. It's going to have the highest wavelength. And it is the least energetic. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's actually different for, for each person, but people will start to see light at a wavelength of about 750. And uh, as you get to about 600, it starts to look kind of orangish or yellow. 500 nanometers looks quite green. And by the time you've got to 400 nanometers, you're talking about something that is purple or violet. And hence the name for wavelengths that are smaller than that or more energetic than that being ultraviolet or beyond violet. And again, most people's eyes, as far as UV, start to kick out at about 400 nanometers. And any wavelengths shorter than that, your eyes just don't respond to. All right, so that is the high points of electromagnetic radiation. And we will talk more about the whole wave aspect of this in the next video. See you there.